The Scholar Progenium. It's history, purpose, and methods. As well as its relationships with prominent business partners and key stakeholders. One Imperium. One vision. The Militarum Tempestus. Efficiency and excellence. The Tempestus Scions and the Commissars that lend discipline to their ranks undergo the same exhaustive training regimen within the Scholar Progenium, yet they fulfill very different and highly specialised roles in battle. Whereas Scions comply with orders without fail, Commissars provide leadership and ensure that the Imperium's commands are enacted dutifully. The halls of the Scholar Progenium are not filled with the dregs of forgotten hive cities, nor do these ancient Imperial facilities flood assigned war zones with the sort of rank-and-file chaff commonly seen amongst the ranks of the Astra Militarum. Instead, the Scholar Progenium takes in the many orphaned children of high-born Imperial citizens. These noble scions may include those left behind by a planetary governor whose term is brought short by some cruel Xenos incursion, or even the sons of a high-ranking commander who has gloriously sacrificed his life for the good of the Imperium. The progeny of such individuals represent a fine stock of potential heroes. Consequently, they are not to be wasted. Upon being orphaned, these children are distributed to the nearest establishment world that harbours a Scholar Progenium training camp. There, the orphans are processed and trained to become the very peak of human efficiency. Shock assault troops without peer, Tempestus Scions are elite soldiers used to enact missions that the regular Imperial Guard cannot accomplish alone. Scions have undergone a brutally uncompromising training regimen and are armed with some of the best weaponry available to the Astra Militarum. Their violent potential is enhanced by rigid discipline, so that the dictates of their superiors are enacted swiftly and accurately, regardless of how inhuman such orders may seem. Scions are trained to ensure that commands are carried out with a merciless pragmatism. Moreover, their indoctrinated sense of obedience and duty overrides any instincts of personal safety. No matter what the foe or the challenge, no matter how catastrophic the situation, Tempestus Scions will stop at nothing to fulfil their orders. They are fully prepared to sacrifice their own lives in the process, so long as it sees their mission completed. These indomitable warriors depend upon their commanders like a lasgun depends upon a trigger. Those among their number who show exceptional qualities in battle may rise to the rank of Tempestor or Tempestor Prime, where they give orders as well as follow them, ensuring that there is never a break in the chain of command. Having committed to memory thousands of military doctrines learned in the Scholar Progenium, a Tempestor Prime is able to guide their squads on the ground, effortlessly processing those split-second battlefield decisions that can mean the difference between success and failure. Their efficiency often provides the opportunity for a vital assault or manoeuvre that can push defeat into victory. Even a few squads of Tempestus Scions precisely deployed can change the course of a war before many regular regiments have even tied their bootlaces. From standing firm against ravenous tyrannid swarms to striking fast against the horrors of a rising tomb world, Tempestus Scions are unyielding in the prosecution of their goals. These elite warriors may hurl themselves from the ramps of low-flying Valkyries, plunging through smoke-filled skies with grav shoots, or they might infiltrate behind enemy lines to neutralize the foe's reinforcements before the threat is fully realized. Riding aboard Torox Primes, Tempestus Scions are able to strike into the most inhospitable of war zones. They can traverse all kinds of terrain in order to rescue planetary officials from the midst of a raid. Such is their unwavering loyalty that some Scions are deemed worthy to be signed as temporary honor guards for Imperial officers. On occasion, 
They have even been selected to escort Inquisitors to and from the Black Ships. As a consequence of the Tempestus Scion's reputation for glorious conduct in battle, the common soldiery of the Imperial Guard often resents or even loathes them. Some of the more ill-disciplined rank and file may exhibit a dangerous insouciance towards orders and regularly indulge in raucous mess hall antics, so the Scion's unequivocal servitude and absolutism does not endear them to their comrades. In fact, the average Imperial Guardsman sees them as little more than overprivileged bully boys with their mag boots on the throats of good, honest soldiers. That Tempestus Scions remain oblivious to such mutterings may be mistaken for arrogance. However, the truth is that they are simply indifferent to the opinions of the common soldiery. So long as their missions are successful and they are not kept idle too long between deployments. When they are dropped into a war zone, these warriors take to war with equipment every bit as specialized as they are. Garbed in Baroque carapace armor with molded plates of armorplas and ceramite that almost entirely cover them, Scions are better able to endure the rigors of battle. The hotshot weaponry of the Militarum Tempestus lights up enemy bunkers and their pinpoint fire rips through Xenos hides and sears through armor alike. These scalding red lasers and the greenish glow of visual augmenters cutting through smoke-filled corridors are often the enemy's first clue that their defenses have been breached. Though for many Tempestus Scions a parade beret will suffice when a unit fights in particularly inhospitable climates, they will opt for masked helmets, through which nutrient gruel and oxygen can be piped. Since they rarely experience times of rest between missions, Tempestus Scions take with them the means to sustain themselves. Those who have remained plugged into their masked helmets can go for days without needing additional nutrition or sleep. They simply stand side by side on their transport between missions in a sort of trance, dormant yet ever alert. Their superiors do not encourage reliance upon these techniques for too long, for in some instances this lack of real sleep can lead to a dependency upon their equipment that can hinder discipline. In extreme cases, such weakness can lead to them being removed from their regiment entirely. The Tempestus Scions that have been elevated to the rank of Tempestor Prime may be rewarded with a regimental greatcoat, an item usually associated with Commissars as an indicator of their shared heritage and the position of command. In addition to this, they may carry a skull-crested staff known as a Cana Militarum. These honours of the Scholar Progenium are only issued to warriors of true distinction. Commissars No matter how contradictory or outright suicidal the orders of the Administratum may seem, it is paramount that such instructions are followed when issued. There is no leniency in the fight for humanity's survival and no allowance for second-guessing what may be at stake should these high-level stratagems be ignored. It may seem nonsensical for troops to leave hostages held within a compound behind, but if dormant necrons lie beneath the surface, then it is better that those captives are left to die than to risk disturbing a greater foe. Likewise, orders to purge defenseless civilian freighter may seem barbaric, but if doing so will prevent the spread of plague or heresy, then such a mission is crucial. It is for good reason that Imperial citizens are told that they should never question the greater wisdom of those above them, even when it goes against their instincts. Individuals of a particularly stern nature are required to enforce such orders and bring any local customs or short-sighted officers who obstruct them into swift compliance. It may be illegal on certain worlds to take up arms on Emperor Day, for instance, but if the Segmentum Command issues orders to mobilize for war, then an uncompromising figure is deployed to ensure the war happens. Such individuals serve as blunt political tools of the Imperium. They must be efficient and merciless, prepared to kill naysayers, even senior officers, in a heartbeat, so that the orders of the Administratum are carried out. These remorseless enforcers of the Imperial Creed are known as Commissars, and they are overseen and deployed by the Officio Prefectus. Wearing an Aquila emblazoned pig cap, a long leather coat with epaulets, and an 
instantly recognizable black uniform with red and gold trim. A commissar stands apart from their subordinates as an executioner stands apart from a crowd of peasants. Marching to war often with only a bolt pistol and sword in their hands, they are a constant reminder that weaponry is no substitute for exceptional bravery, zeal, and martial pride. The strict training regimens of the Scholar Progenium transform commissars into exceptional combatants in their own right. Where they differ most from Tempestus Scions is in their role of giving orders where necessary. They possess a higher level of authority to command than even a Tempest or Prime, though they often serve alongside other Imperial officers, taking command only when they sense weakness in their charges. When acting at the head of a unit, a Commissar is required to make brutal judgement calls in order to get the most out of his men, and each Commissar is rightly feared and respected by the forces under his command. Groups of soldiers under a Commissar's command can take any size and hail from disparate regiments from across the galaxy. Such units will have more or less respect for Imperial authority depending upon their origins and the discipline of their commanding officers. Whether such soldiers are hindered by local superstitions or are inclined to run at the sight of the more hideous of the galaxy's denizens, it is within the Commissar's authority and his express duty to punish such infractions usually by summary execution in the form of a bolt pistol round through the head. It is also a Commissar's duty to inspire the men around him, leading by example with bolt pistol flaring and sword carving through the enemy ranks. A Commissar is always willing to show what the best blood in the Imperium is capable of when his deeds will rouse the lower orders into action often expending far more of his ammunition than those individual soldiers who follow him. A Commissar's uncompromising code of law ensures discipline. As such, regiments to which a Commissar is assigned become far more robust and coherent formations. When soldiers falter, a Commissar ensures they do not flee. Where they are weak, a Commissar renews their strength. But where soldiers show cowardice, a Commissar will make examples of them without hesitation, earning his men's grudging respect. A Commissar transforms ordinary troopers into superior fighting machines. When this iron determination and tactical autonomy are wedded to the Tempestus Scion's specialist abilities and lauded martial discipline, the resultant formations are dependable beyond all reasonable expectations. Having trained and developed in the same environment, each is aware of the other's strengths and will instinctively respond the same way in a firefight. The Scions of the Militarum Tempestus have a proud reputation for remaining steadfast in the face of death, but with a Commissar amongst their ranks, they will fight to the last man. The Scholar Progenium the Scholar Progenium is a widespread imperial institution with ancient training facilities distributed somewhat thinly around the galaxy, built into the bedrock of planets with strong connections to Terra and the Adeptus Ministorum. Uh, though a subdivision of the Ecclesiarchy oversees the distribution of new cadets, each Scholar Progenium's graduates, known as Progenia, uh, go on to serve many different appendages of the Imperium. Within the training camps, most join the ranks of the Militarum Tempestus, or Officio Perfectus, whilst some daughters may be chosen to serve in the Adeptus Sororitas, and potential psychers are rooted out and sent to the black ships. Those who show particularly ardent faith may join the Adeptus Ministorum itself. A very few select orphans may find their fate is to be recruited into the Inquisition, or be whisked away to train under the shadowy auspices of the Officio Assassinorum. Scholar Progenium's have little interaction with the outside world and are most commonly found in isolated regions. Their great cathedral-like facades uh, jut out from remote mountaintops or ravines, while a few of the most prestigious are surrounded by moats of bubbling lava. Time-ravaged gargoyles loom over any who approach their vast iron gates and sentries patrol their crenellated walls, as much to stop cadets from escaping 
as to keep unwanted visitors from gaining access. Yet tucked away behind these vast Baroque walls, scholar progeniums contain mostly drab, slab-sided buildings, the layout of which all follow a similar template. By design, the insides of scholar progeniums are not places to be admired. Indeed, their inductees are expected to loathe every moment they spend in them. Inside each scholar progenium facility, servitors were along the sparse ferrocrete hallways, constantly monitoring the progress of cadets. Recorded hollow images are relayed back to the chambers of the drill abbots, the hammer-wielding ecclesiarchy officers who oversee each training camp and who are responsible for the progress of new recruits. Auto-rhetorical servo skulls incessantly babble the orders of the hour, issuing cadets with harsh commands, instructions and inspiring stories of imperial heroes. Within these halls, new cadets are tested and interrogated by dark-robed clerics, who search incessantly for any signs of spiritual weakness or corruption. While every cadet sleeps, servo skulls monitor their slightest eye twitch for signs of seditious dreams. Should any foul utterances be heard within range of the Drill Abbot surveillance network, those cadets are swiftly ushered into nearby chambers to endure punishment vigils. Within hangar-sized auditoriums, cadets are lectured on imperial language and history. Thousands of cadets sit in rows of desks, scrawling down the litanies or tactics bellowed from roving vox casters. When they are not either learning by rote there or undergoing basic combat drills in high-walled courtyards, cadets study further within the cathedral-sized librariums. A cadet's every waking hour is filled with memorization of Holy Scripture, strategy implementation exercises, the practical testing of theoretical tactical formula, and brutal physical tests of skill and endurance. When they are allowed to sleep, subliminal reconditioning treatment takes place. Certainly, scholar progenium training camps are miserable places for a cadet to spend their young life, but this relentless hardship is administered with good reason. Once a cadet has endured the rigors of one of these training camps, they will be clad in mental armor as well as physical when they fight the horrors of the wider galaxy. Tools of the Tempestus the war gear used by Tempestus Scions is far superior to the rugged, uh, utilitarian weaponry of the Astra Militarum. Specialist training and maintenance is required by the Departmento Munitorum for each piece of kit. A scholar Tempestus cadet must pass a series of tests and earn the appropriate honors before even being allowed to use a hotshot las gun in battlefield conditions. Each time a weapon or piece of war gear is mastered, the icon of that equipment is branded onto his chest as a permanent sign of his competence. Once the full suite of weaponry and war gear has been earned, a Tempestus Scion is able to wage war for weeks at a time without resupply in a wide variety of hostile battlefield conditions. The Riser Pattern Hotshot Lasgun and manufactured in the finest incantoriums that the Forge world of Riser can provide. This las gun does not use a clip-like power pack as with those of the Imperial Guard, but instead a hyper-yield power array, worn as a backpack rig. By adjusting this rig, the hotshot las gun, it can be calibrated to emit bursts of such penetrative power they can punch straight through ceramite. At its maximum capacity, the las gun operates in the 60 megafuel range and holds enough potential energy that it is warm to the touch. Slate Moniton Dexteria Configuration uh, The data slates worn upon the armoured forearm gauntlet of the typical Tempestus Scion allows him instant access to his Tempestus Prime's latest command runes and war psalms. It also monitors vital signs showing the pulse rate and health matrix of the wearer at all times, so that his officer can instantly assess his condition. It was the slate monotron that led to the old guardsman jibe that Tempestus Scions are dead inside, for upon completion of their training, their hearts are locked in an iron box mounted on their sleeve. Of course, if this joke is ever uttered within reach of a commissar, a severe punishment will follow. The Omni Shield Helm, 
slash resp masquerade. In hostile environments, a Tempestus Regiment will don all-enclosing Omnishield helms. Their resp masks proof against everything from industrial pollution to fully ignited atmospheres. When sealed, they allow Tempestus Scions to operate even in airless vacuums for limited periods of time. The multispectral oculum that attaches via suction to the wearer's eye sockets allow him to see in low light and occluded conditions with relative ease. The Riser Patton Hotshot Volley Gun. Considered by many Tempestus Primes to be the ultimate weapon deployed by the Militarum Tempestus, the Hotshot Volley Gun is a truly fearsome firearm. Incorporating penitent class heat sink arrays, these weapons can maintain a punishing rate of high powered fire. The Monoscope. Though it can be used to project a beam of light, the Monoscope is primarily intended as a visual uploader, panning left and right as the Tempestus Scion goes about the prosecution of war. Each monoscope can be tapped into by any Tempestor or Tempestor Prime who wishes to see what his subordinate is witnessing. The act of covering up a monoscope's lens, whether accidentally or by design, is punishable by a full day's electro-whipping and a number of days without rations at the commanding officer's discretion. The Clarion Vox Array The cumbersome Vox Arrays of the Astra Militarum are often known as Ghost Boxes, for with the white noise and interference patterns of battle raging all around, it is difficult to coax more than a whisper from their speakers. Not so the clarion vox array of the Militarum Tempestus, a triumph of audio military hardware that overrides its designated airwaves with the crystal clear and perfectly enunciated commands of the Tempestors leading each detachment. Forging of a Killer Tempestus Scions and Commissars are remorseless and efficient killers, but these warriors are not born that way. They are forged within the Scholar Progenium, harsh training camps based on long-established Imperial worlds. It is these ancient facilities that are responsible for taking the orphaned offspring of the Imperium and transforming them into ruthless soldiers. One Imperium, one vision. That is the motto of the Scholar Progenium. It is designed to homogenize, break, and rebuild the orphan sons and daughters of the Imperial elite. It transforms them from frightened children into loyal warriors ready to fight and die in the name of the Emperor, or into fearsome, iron-fisted authoritarians who keep the wheels of the Adeptus Terror in motion. In the aftermath of the many atrocities so common in the 41st millennium, any newly created orphans who are of aristocratic blood are brought to the attention of the nearest officio perfectus officials, who are tasked with dealing with the aftershocks of a battle and salvaging anything still useful to the Imperium. Many a commissar has marched through a corpse-strewn walkway of a planetary governor's palace to discover a forlorn son or daughter who has been hiding, safe but alone, in some underground bunker. The commissar, having come from a similar background, will ensure that such a child does not go to waste. Quickly and efficiently, he assigns it to a starship bound for the nearest scholar progenium. It is even whispered that when it is in the Imperium's best interests, the officio perfectus may steal a prospective new recruit. Sometimes a child, whose parents are still alive, may be judged to have shown remarkable qualities, and their presence on a backwater world may be considered an inefficient use of those skills when they could be put to better effect in an Imperial facility. The rumour has it that a Commissar will ensure that such resources are allocated more efficiently, even if the protesting parents have to be removed from the equation in order to do so. Children arrive at the vast scholar progeniums at a range of ages. Some come when they are as young as six Terran years, while others are as old as twelve. Most inductees are orphaned in large groups, following a single planetary disaster. Though occasionally individuals are thrown into larger groups, if it is convenient. New recruits undergo a series of mental and physical examinations, but this is solely for the benefit of the facility. 
Should the cadet have been gleaned from a planet on the wrong end of a plague or spiritual rebellion, then the last thing the drill abbots would want is for that same corruption to break out within a confined, isolated complex and savage its young inmates. Cadets, I should say. Cadets are divided by age to form training groups that will ultimately, in the case of the Militarum Tempestus, form the basis of their full battle regiments to maintain a sense of brotherhood. A group sizes can start off as large as 200 at any one time, though those who would not make the worthy servants of the Imperium are quickly weeded out and are not seen again by their classmates. Whereas the Astra Militarum is made up of soldiers from a large number of different cultures, the progena of the Scholar Progenium are not permitted cultural variety. Though they may arrive there from different worlds, they are quickly recast in the same Imperial mould. As a result of this, they can be relied upon to put the orders of their superiors first and foremost before any local loyalties. So that the Scholar Progenium becomes their sole reality, cadets are taught to forget their old existences. They are stripped of their former clothing and of any belongings they may have brought with them. They are issued only with simple black uniforms and standardized equipment and training gear, which they are expected to wear and use throughout their training. Recruits are forced to abandon their birth names and are instead provided with new ones, chosen from a long list of legendary heroes of the Imperium. This is as much to remind them of the excellence to which they must aspire as it is to remove their identity. One exception to these traditional processes is when siblings arrive. They are not deprived of their familial connections, as these have been found to encourage greater competition, as well as fostering stronger internal ties in the long term. Such uniformity is easier to accept for very young students than it is for those who have spent longer in their parents' cultures. But mindscaping is always necessary to facilitate the commitment to the ways of the Scholar Progenium anyway. Sometimes, for habitual prejudices, this clarity of thought can be achieved by simple techniques, such as repetition of litanies for weeks on end. However, at some point, every cadet is strapped down to an iron chair known as a correction throne. Needles are then inserted through the rear of the cadet's skull, and their heads are flooded with dirus, a neurochemical fluid that cleanses their synapses, wiping away old memories and paving the way for new information. It is an unfortunate and little discussed fact that the Imperium possesses ever-dwindling stocks of dirus, and it is increasingly being diluted with more dubious substances. While cadets endure such treatments, autovox skulls relay righteous speeches, war cries, or simply inspiring quotes from ecclesiarchal texts to properly and irrevocably infuse them with the wonder of their new creed. Sadly, even the scholar Progenium's mindscaping techniques are not infallible. Dreams and visions from previous existences will haunt some recruits for the rest of their lives. A scion may never fully rid himself of the nightmarish visions that linger from his homeworld or the trauma of the death of his parents. As with all such matters, the Scholar Progenium's methodology goes unquestioned. However, it is always a concern when a cadet shows too strong an unwillingness to properly conform. As reward for their independence, they are often released into the training grounds only to be hunted down by their former comrades. This serves as much to bond the remaining cadets as it does to punish individually. If a cadet uh, publicly disobeys orders, they will meet a spectacular and very public end, courtesy of a drill abbot's great hammer. What little remains of their spine is coiled within a glass box and mounted within the dormitory to serve as a warning to others. This is not at the extreme end of remedial punishments. In the Scholar Progenium facility on Brelax, uh, the products of one incident remain forever enshrined, Due to a faulty batch of mindscaping chemicals, a whole year group rose up against the dictates of their masters. The seething abbot prime ordered the officio prefectus to crush the rebellion. While still alive, the mutinous cadets were meshed with mortar and used to line the scholars' uh, ferrocrete walls. To this day, their bones 
jut out of long corridors, grasping for freedom as a warning of the consequences of insubordination. The Cadet Force Scholar progenium training may be considered a drawn-out form of torture. Indeed, injured limbs or broken minds are hardly uncommon. Cadets undergo basic physical drills in heavy armour, quickly tiring them out as they scale walls or squeeze under razor wire. A cuff from the drill abbot's gauntleted hand and the sight of his great hammer is usually enough to encourage a lethargic cadet to try harder. Military exercises with live ammunition are conducted in the harsh landscape surrounding a scholar progenium or its nearby moons. Cadets are often expected to endure days in the wilderness with little food or instruction, and limited weaponry with which to combat whatever violent fauna roams the planet. Yet with each grueling day, cadets improve in their performance. Their speed and endurance increases. They scale walls previously thought impossible to overcome, and it becomes obvious to even a novice drill abbot that true warriors are being forged. It is a strong belief within the Scholar Progenium that from the hottest of fires, the strongest bonds of brotherhood are born. Whatever the technique, this tutelage serves to better divine what path a cadet is suited for, as well as preparing them for the brutalities of the 41st millennium. Indeed, the training regimen within the Scholar Progenium exists not just to create highly skilled combatants, Amidst the trials and challenges, the Drill Abbot will constantly assess and reassess as to who will make an excellent Tempestus Scion, an excellent Commissar, or who would be better suited within the Adeptus Terror. However, some scholars use more esoteric methods of selection. For example, the Abbot Prime of the Scholar Progenium Facility on Sanctus Omega is a known reader of the Empress Tarot and uses the mystical cards to steer his judgment or decide upon a cadet's path. Technically, no one role is considered more prestigious than another, though commissars are generally held to be the most redoubtable of the scholar's trainees. Each graduate has a highly specific role within the Imperium at large, and such skills need to be discerned well in advance of the trials of compliance. The most important stage of a cadet's time at the Scholar Progenium. The Trials of Compliance Each scholar progenium employs one or more challenges to separate those who will become commissars from those who will join the Militarum Tempestus. These tests take diverse forms, but the primary purpose of all such trials of compliance is to highlight those cadets who are best committed to obeying orders in adversity and test how they process those commands. Of course, a percentage of the supplicants fail in their allotted task. Many end up as equerries or thralls of the Scholar Progenium. As some of these disappointments may work through their sentences as menials and eventually be permitted to join the regular Astra Militarum. Ever eager to prove their worth, these few may yet become Imperial soldiers in their own right. For potential Tempestus Scions, Trials of compliance may involve live fire exercises in the hallucinarium. In endless labyrinths, cadets are constantly exposed to strange visions and false suggestions. Yet the prospective initiates are expected to follow the correct orders without hesitation, no matter how strange those orders may be, and no matter how monstrous the entities they come up against. There are timed physical tests too, such as scaling the grand facade of the facility, while constantly chanting that particular scholar progenium's motto. Should the candidate's incantation slip out of sync from the metronomic tempo of the servo skull hovering nearby, the cadet may soon have gunfire to contend with, in addition to the high walls. For potential commissars, the trials of compliance usually take even more esoteric forms. Without knowing it is a test, a cadet may be commanded to locate one of his closest colleagues, a comrade with whom he has shared the trials and tribulations of the Scholar Progenium over many years, and shoot him through the head. Such a callous execution order serves a dual purpose, as it proves that the Cadet Commissar can not only follow Imperial orders, but that he or she will have no problem killing stubborn officers when in the heat of battle. However, the Scholar Progenium recognises the danger posed by a highly trained cadet 
who shows the promise of a commissar, but who cannot follow such an order. Prospective commissars who fail this trial will end up being victim to the same challenge issued to another candidate, or released as quarry for a group of potential scions. A few brave adepts within the Adeptus Ministorum, uh, who suggest that all of this is a waste of good talent, are reminded that these trials are essential to wean out the truly remorseless from those haunted by doubt. Besides, there are always thousands more orphans delivered into their hands each year. Such losses are hardly of import. Selection Day After successful cadets have survived their various trials of compliance, the Drill Abbots will allocate them their path in an event known as Selection Day. It is then that the truly hard challenges begin. Selection Days in the Scholar Progenium mark the point at which a cadet is assigned their destiny. Cavernous ships descend into planetary orbit, ready to export Progenia to their new roles. From dawn to dusk, amidst the slow incantation of ancient litanies and clouds of incense, cadets are divided according to their selected path. A good many discover that they are to head into the ranks of the Adeptus Terror. Those young women, who show not only fine military skills, but strong signs of faith, are prepared to journey to the training convents of the Adeptus Sororitas, while others may join the Adeptus Arbites. The most talented warriors are chosen for the Militarum Tempestus and Officio Prefectus. Each group is assigned to a ship and consequently dispatched to the appropriate Scholar Tempestus or Scholar Prefectus for more advanced training. Regiments of the Militarum Tempestus the following are a broad selection of some of the more famous Tempestus regiments, along with some of their more notable actions. The 55th Capic Eagles The deeds of the 55th are legendary among the forces of the Militarum Tempestus. Tempestus Prime Magnus Crassus, whose brother is also renowned throughout the Ordo Tempestus, is a formidable soldier and an inspiration to thousands of new progenia. Under Crassus's leadership, the 55th Kepic Eagles have won countless victories on behalf of the Ordo Tempestus. Few regiments of the Militarum Tempestus, a lot of Tempestus here, have achieved greater honours in war, and their deeds typify the obedience, excellence, and efficiency for which they are known. It was the 55th Kepic Eagles who boarded the Orc scrapship Scarfist and destroyed it, saving the Valdax system. The 55th Capic Eagles aided the Space Wolves of Eric Morkai's Great Company against Wordbearers upon Fell Break Free. These elite Militarum Tempestus soldiers were responsible for crippling the Crimson Slaughter Strike Force upon the Yabrakayan Ice Worlds and led the destruction of a traitor filled hive city upon the Voral Shrine World. When the legendary Ordo Tempestus relics, the barbed gauntlets of Avatus, had been stolen by Eldar from Craft World Altensar, the Scions of the 55th Kepic Eagles were summoned to retrieve them. With vengeful purpose, the Eagles smashed through wave upon wave of Guardians in order to reclaim them. The Kepic Eagles wear a vertical white bar, which is displayed upon the armor, and is said to embody the singular purity of purpose of the regiment. Clear, cold, free from embellishment, and individuality. This minimalist icon epitomizes everything it means to be a Tempestus Scion of this renowned regiment. The Eagles Pray The 55th Kepic Eagles were dispatched on a mission to bring a halt to the rampage of the Orc kill cruiser Scarfist before its freebooter crew could reach the Valdex system. However, the mission was jeopardized when the elite scions of the Militarum Tempestus, led by Tempestor Prime Magnus Crassus, unexpectedly found themselves up against the Greenskin's own elite. The instant the Orc kill cruiser known as Scarfist entered the Valdex system, planning its destruction became a top priority for their system's Imperial commanders. The ship was commandeered by the notorious Captain Troglazik who led a vicious and highly destructive band of orc freebooter outcasts. 
A series of valuable protein sluice agri-worlds stretched before Troglazik, and a source of nutrient gruel for billions of people throughout the system was under threat. With scant local military resources, the Order Tempestus decided the only way to prevent a disaster was for Troglazik's freebooters to be eliminated before Planet 4 by an elite regiment of the Militarum Tempestus, the 55th Kepic Eagles. Commanded by Tempestal Prime Magnus Crassus, the Eagles first had to board the monstrous ship, a monumental task in itself, for the kill cruiser bristled with gun decks and all manner of firepower, and its hull was filled to overflowing with barbarous warriors. Once aboard, they would drop a Prometheum accelerator into the heart of the ship's volatile fuel ducts, activate it and retreat. To further complicate the mission, the 55th Kepic Eagles would be operating blind, there being no logic to the construction of kill cruisers and their often narrow labyrinthine passageways. A handful of aged Imperial frigates, rust buckets destined for the salvage yard, put up a frail resistance as a distraction to the orc ship as it drifted into orbit around the first agri-world. The Eagles' Valkyries flew in close to the kill cruiser and deployed the elite troopers. Utilising grav chutes, mag boots and resp masks, the Scions boarded the Scarfist. Once in the crudely constructed passageways, Crassus directed his teams as a single force towards the closest potential point of access to the fuel ducts. The Orcs of Troglazik's crew were at first unaware of the threat inside their ship. Crassus gave strict orders to void engaging the Greenskins where possible. The Scions fired only when necessary, eliminating those Orcs they could not avoid, so as not to attract the attention of a race that thrived on combat. Only when word of intruders reached the command deck did the Orcs begin a cohesive counterattack. Like moths to a flame, the Orcs swarmed towards the Scions. The Militarum Tempestus warriors found themselves beset by dozens of freebooter commandos and storm boys, some of the most cunning Orcs in existence. At the center of the throng, in the red light of the Scarfis, stood a furious Captain Troglizik. At a single hand signal, that apparently they were all able to see, the Eagles altered their tactics to the fourth of dozens of pre-planned schemes. Knowing that the Orcs would be drawn to the largest fight, Tempestor Prime Crassus ordered the force to split into two. Crassus remained with the majority of the Scions who stood their ground against the Greenskins. While they provided a furious distraction, Tempestor Gyrantus led a smaller team, carrying the Prometheum Accelerator back through the Scarfist's air vents to find another route. Across a vast, scrap-panelled hold of the kill cruiser, Crassus made a blistering forward strike into the heart of the Greenskins. It was the first of a series of hit-and-run strikes utilising the haphazard layout of the ship's hold, which infuriated Troglazik's freebooters despite their numbers. The Scions burned through the targets in front of them, then scrambled up onto a higher platform. The Storm Boys went berserk, activating their rocket packs to begin a running battle high above the floors amidst the ship's gantries. Captain Troglazik directed his commandos, who climbed hand over hand to intercept the Scions on the highest level. And the Orcs surged towards the Eagles. The nimble Scions evaded slugger fire and chopper swings, responding with precise blasts from their hotshot las guns. But their casualties were mounting. Crassus was ever aware of the need to keep moving, to goad the orcs further, to leave them in a fury before moving position. The speed at which the Scions relocated was far greater than even the Storm Boys could manage in the cramped confines. Whenever the Commandos and Storm Boys attempted to close like a claw around the squads of Scions, the troopers would rapidly change course, whittling down the wrathful mobs with hotshot fire. All the while, Tempestal Prime Crassus was placing munitions along the hull, ready to activate later when they came to make their exit. Eventually, the clarion Voxnet buzzed with news from Tempestus Garantus of the second squad. He alerted Crassus that the Prometheum Accelerator had been cast into the fuel ducts. The Scions were now racing against time. It would not take the Accelerator long to destabilize the fuel system. While Garantus' squad crawled back through makeshift vents towards the outer hull of the kill cruiser, Crassus' squads of Scions had to fight their way out. Their furious dash had successfully drawn the Orcs' attention, but now they needed to shake free of their foe and find their own exit. Crassus had planned for this as well. 
His squads provided cover for him to set the last of the munitions and activate the timer through his slate monotron. Crassus's trap detonated on cue, a shower of scrap and shrapnel collapsing on the rising orcs, sending the storm boys plummeting back down to the floor and scattering the rest of the greenskins. In the lull of battle, the remaining scions vanished through a vent. Crassus, following a route mapped out on his slate monotron by Garantus, steered the rest of the 55th back out towards the surface of the Scarfist. As their waiting Valkyries tuck off amidst a storm of fire from the kill cruiser's flak batteries, the ship's fuel reserves finally began to overheat. The resulting explosions as the Scarfist ignited lit up the sector like a dying sun. Bitter Salvation Commissar Dacius Crassus, brother of Tempestal Prime, Magnus Crassus, as previously mentioned, was given what should have been a simple mission to smuggle out the planetary governor of Zaris, ahead of the invasion of Hive Fleet Leviathan. The Katajan squads the Commissar had to hand were demoralized after a previous campaign against the Tyranids, jeopardizing the operation. Despite Zaras being a populous world, holding the planet against the Tyranids was never seriously conceded. It would simply be impossible. However, the planetary governor, Valara Dresus, was deemed essential personnel and worth saving. Commissar Crassus's orders were to take the nearby Katachan 1845th and escort her off-planet. The Katachans had recently suffered heavy casualties after fighting Tyranids on a nearby shrine world, where they lost... 83% of their regiment. 400 men remained, mostly new recruits. Upon making planet fall, Commissar Crassus and the Catachans could only get to within a mile of the governor's palace, though he had anticipated only Tyranid vanguard organisms, massed creatures swarmed through the streets, and winged horrors cluttered up the skies. The first waves of the fatigued and dispirited Catachan 1845 to be sent forward into battle proved insufficient, as swarms of brood warriors shredded Crassus's men. Even those veterans who had faced the High Fleet before were unable to hold their ground. In a foolish display of insubordination, one Catachan refused to go any further. Crassus promptly executed him. The Commissar was forced to spearhead advances personally, leading the line with almost suicidal fervor. Each time the Catachan 1845 were propelled into action, but soldier after soldier was rendered into bloody ruin as they neared the palace. Then Crassus received a Vox message that the 99th Deltic Gargoines, led by Tempestor Prime Cadmir, were making planetfall amidst Leviathan's deluge. Squads of Scions grab-shooted through the spore-choked skies, obliterating organisms from the air with a latticework of hot-shot lasgun fire. As soon as the Gargoines joined up with the Commissar, he reaffirmed their orders. The combined Imperial force cut through the swarm to reach the Governor's compound, yet the Commissar's fortune was short-lived. When the Imperial troops reached the palace's central quadrangle, they were forced to slaughter scores of servants sporting strange tattoos, each droning allegiance to the Dark Gods. Tempestor Prime Cadmir discovered the Governor, only to find that she too had turned to chaos. If she had hoped her devotion to heretical power would be her salvation in the face of the Tyranid menace, she was wrong. Cadmer and Crassus had clear orders to retrieve Valeria Drissus, and that was precisely what they were going to do, even if she had given herself to the ruinous powers. Crassus nonplussed, a reason that his commanders might already have known of the governor's treachery. Perhaps they wished to punish or interrogate her. The remaining Catachans, however, were furious at having to fight on behalf of a corrupted highborn, and they didn't try to hide their bitterness. In stern tones, Crassus made it clear that anyone who did not fight would be killed within an instant. Only two men were stubborn enough to attempt to raise their las guns, and with two searing blasts from his plasma pistol, Crassus reminded the rest of the Catachans of their mission. At that, Tempestal Prime Cadmir had one of the gargoyles subdue the rabid Valeria dresses with trank injects. The Scions then bound the governor and took it in turns to carry her through the corridors. Two soldiers walked at the rear of the escort, vigilant in case any dark sorcery within her blood brought her back to consciousness. 
As the Imperial forces progressed back through the compound, a Morlock burst through the paving of a nearby courtyard, hundreds of swarm creatures surging forth in its wake to pour into the surrounding buildings. Cadmir immediately set about neutralizing the monster without a second thought. The two squads of Scions rushed ahead with him. Dozens of hotshot lasgun blasts marred the creature's thick chitin, exercising a thick chunk of its flank and sending it buckling onto its side like a felled tree. The Scions spread out to target the creatures from multiple angles. No sooner had they killed it than Tempestal Prime Cadmer felt the ground rumbling. He predicted another creature was somewhere below and signaled his concern to the Commissar, who reacted accordingly. Crassus led the Catajans in an advance into a sea of gaunts that blocked the exit route. The Astra Militarum soldiers unleashed withering volleys from their las guns, and their hundred strong ranks provided the firepower to send what remained of the swarm scurrying for safety. The Catajans cleared the way through to the gateway of the compound, and the 99th Deltic Gargoyans uh, quickly caught up with them. Around them, Morlocks continued to burst from the floor of the compound. More Tyranids flooded through the vacant corridors, hunting the Scions. Cadmer directed the placement of explosives in his squad's wake, buckling the gates of the palace and sending rubble flying in order to block the creature's progress. Once outside, Tempestal Prime Cadmer relayed a message on the Clarion Voxeray. Within moments, several Valkyries soared across the darkening skies towards a prearranged evac point in the distance. Their mission had now turned into a race against the swarm, and Leviathan unleashed a deluge of creatures at the retreating soldiers. The Scions were forced to slow to match the Catachan's pace, but Cadmer used this time to refine the evacuation plan. He ordered his Scions to extend out into a thin corridor. Their superior skills and weaponry would buy time for their allies against the skittering Tyranids on the ground, and two of the Valkyries were called on to provide cover from the air against the winged creatures. Eventually, the Scions secured a safe landing zone for their transports. Crassus and the Catachans were the first to board, as the Valkyries lifted off from the field strewn with dead Tyranids. The Governor awoke to find himself looking directly into the barrel of the Commissar's plasma pistol. The 68th Deltic Lions The 68th are well known for their ability to endure some of the most toxic worlds in the Imperium. Indeed, numerous noxious quagmires have proven to have little effect upon their bodies. Where other regiments have perished upon planets ravaged by plagues, the Deltic Lions have survived some of the most virulent contagions in the galaxy. Their renowned immunity has led to them regularly being summoned when the Inquisition's Auto Malleus suspect the minions of the plague god Nurgle at work in a war zone. However, their resilience against disease has also made the 68th Deltic Lions objects of curiosity for Grandfather Nurgle himself, and he often sends his demons to investigate the Scions in his uniquely horrifying manner. As such, the 68th possess a long and glorious history of combating Nurgle's forays into the galaxy. With a sequence of blistering strikes, they destroyed a cult of Nurgle on Hive World Mularian before their foulness could spread to the rest of the populace. On the ring world of Avatroid, the Scions fought alongside the Space Marines of the Aurora chapter. Together, they controlled the burgeoning demonic incursion and destroyed the infected citizens saving the majority of Avatoid's populace. But perhaps the 68th Deltic Lion's greatest victory came against a warband of the Purge, who attacked their Scholar Progenium facility in the Scara Sector. Having rushed back to the defense of their Scholar Progenia, the Scions utilized decoy units to lure the corpulent Space Marines into a nearby ice ravine, where the deep snow and cold confounded the traitor's movements. Surrounding Scions then attacked with overlapping fields of ruby-red hotshot fire and incinerated the threat. Ever since that day, a small garrison of the Deltic Lions remains attached to the Scholar Progenium, vigilantly checking the skies for further visits from Nurgle's minions to ensure their Scholar is safe. The provenance of the symbol borne by the 68th Deltic Lions is unclear. Some believe it to be an ancient Terran symbol associated with victory in the face of misfortune. If so, this would certainly seem apt, for the lions have endured and achieved victory 
amid some of the most horrific conditions in the galaxy. The Vindication of Brelius A mission to the ring world of Avatroid offered an opportunity for Tempestor Brelius to make amends for a previous sin. Fighting alongside the Aurora chapter, the soldier hoped to find redemption in the eyes of his allies by proving his worth to the Imperium, even if this attempt should cost him his life. When the 60th Deltic Lions were summoned to the small ring world of Avatroid to support the Aurora chapter, Tempestor Brelius was eager to prove his value to the Ordo Tempestus. In his previous mission, he had failed to execute a kill order in time, jeopardizing the whole operation, and he now had a black mark to his name. He saw his opportunity when the Lions, who were known amongst the Ordo Tempestus for their immunity to some of the universe's most stubborn poxies, were ordered to Avatroid in the face of a huge incursion of plague-carrying demons. No more than a hundred miles in circumference, the ancient ring world featured lush forests that bordered a narrow band of a hive city, which stretched around the entirety of the world. A small force of the Aurora chapter had diverted from their mission to investigate a warp rift which had opened there, but the demonic surge from within had proved beyond even their ability to control. The Space Marines sent an astropathic request for aid, and a large contingent of the 68th arrived swiftly. Their mission was simple. Alongside the Aurora chapter, they were to drive the demonic forces back towards the rift, which lay in a quarantine sector of the city that would be destroyed from space. Imperial citizens or soldiers who showed symptoms of the plague were to be either killed outright or driven into that same quarantine sector. The 68th divided into two separate contingents for the operation, and each would link up with two of the Aurora chapter's tactical squads on the surface. One spearhead was led by Tempestor Prime Justark, and the other by Tempestor Brelius. Both divisions of Scions progressed by Torox Prime in separate directions across the streets of the Ringworld, heading towards the coordinates assigned to them by the Space Marines. Meanwhile, a handful of PDF troopers were to redirect the remaining civilians. They would be assessed on a large scale by Commissar Valix and his retinue, who were stationed at various points within the Hive City. Commissar Valix had been given the order to neutralize anyone who so much as coughed suspiciously. Eventually, Tempestor Brelius' group of Scions established Vox Communications with the warriors of the Adeptus Astartes, after first identifying them by the sound of distant bolter fire. The Imperial forces then began a systematic purge and drove the demons down the streets of the Ringworld, pushing them into the quarantine zone. As the Space Marines and Scions dealt with the shambling hordes street by street, a swarm of plague drones burst forth en masse from the forest. The Rotflies and their Plague Bearer riders swarmed around the Space Marines, forcing the Aurora chapter back. More Plague Bearers and Nurglings oozed from the nearby buildings to surround Brelius' Scions, isolating them further. Hotshot Lasfire exploded swollen stomachs and enormous pustules. But then, a great unclean one lumbered out of the atrium of a hab block and lurched towards Brelius, lashing out at his scions as it came. The Tempestor's desperate shots had little effect other than angering the demon, and in response it surged forward and heaved its enormous sword through the air, one of its great strikes clipping the Tempestor, throwing him from his feet and severing his breathing apparatus. The great unclean one leant over the fallen Tempestor, rank fluids spattering down from its maw. But the combined hotshot fire of the remaining squads burned into it, tearing at its essence until, with a gurgling cry, it retreated. Yet tiny organisms had wormed through Brellus's damaged mask, and he began to cough bubbling bile. One of the hitherto untouched 68th Deltic Lions had succumbed to one of Nurgle's diseases. Brellius still had orders, and though his keen senses and battle skills were beginning to fade, he concealed his suffering from his fellow Tempestus troopers. He certainly did not show it to the Adeptus Astartes. As rampant disease began to take over his body, he pulled his resp mask firmly over his face to hide his dribbling eyes. The full force of the Imperium united, and both Space Marine and Scion continued to push back the plague victims and their demonic infectors to the quarantine section of the Ringworld. 
Now that the demons were clustered together, the Space Marines and Militarum Tempestus formed long lines of raging bulk guns and hotshot las guns. Against this wall of devastating firepower, the demons collapsed or exploded, or simply retreated in the intended direction. Even the Great Unclean One could be seen heading away from the Imperial forces, a wave of plague bearers and nurglings behind it. Finally, all of the cities infected were herded into the quarantine sector. Corridors were sealed off around them, streets were made impassable by timed munitions, and the surrounding forest was burned. But it quickly transpired that there would still be a route by which the herded infected could attempt to flee. They could reach the safe zone by clambering over each other's bodies to scale the ruined Munifactorum at the western edge of the quarantine zone. Someone needed to stay at the perimeter to keep the infected throng in place. Whoever remained would surely die in the blast. Still concealing his bilious coughs and bleeding eyes, Tempestor Brellius volunteered himself. Armed with munitions and grenades, the Tempestor took up position in the ruin to the west. While the Imperium's warriors retreated to their support craft, Brellius lurched back and forth across the ruin, hurling grenades and pouring hotshot gunfire into the demons and citizens who threatened to spill from the quarantine zone. A minute later, a Space Marine strike cruiser fired its colossal lasers, and a whole sector of the ring world became a raging inferno. The 54th Sign Jackals After their ancient training world was destroyed by the Tyranids of High Fleet Leviathan, the 54th now possess a temporary garrison upon the Maiden World of Maliok. Since adjusting to the planet's environment, they have developed more sophisticated methods of tracking and surveillance. Because of the numerous war hosts that frequently make planetfall upon Maylock, the 54th are now specialized hunters of Eldar. Indeed, very few in the Militarum Tempestus are as adept at tracking their warriors and wraith-bone constructs or at evading their reality-bending firepower. Much of the Scion's equipment has been reprogrammed accordingly and their theoretical tactics dispatched in mono-slate briefing files to other Tempestus regiments. In order to test the robustness of these tactics, the Ordo Tempestus has sent the Jackals on missions to combat Eldar from numerous craft worlds. On each occasion, the Scions have proven increasingly proficient at dealing with these ancient and elusive aliens. One of the Scions' most Glorious missions was on the death world of Rax V, where the Scions were forced to march through miles of toxic jungle to deal with the numerous attacks of an Ulthwi strike force. For days, the Eldar had been assaulting the Imperium's fortifications in revenge for an Astra Militarum raid against one of their support craft. The Scions of the 54th were ordered simply to purge the Eldar from the planet, thanks to the skills they had developed upon Maylock. Uh, the Tempestus troopers correctly anticipated 67% of the Ulfwi Eldar's movements and flight patterns. The Jackals were even able to ambush and destroy a squad of Aspect Warriors as they emerged from a Wraith Gate. The Black Jackal, the regimental symbol of the 54th Scion Jackals, is amongst the more menacing used by the Militarum Tempestus. This is in keeping with the iconography of the regiment as a whole and speaks volumes about the morbid and menacing character of their dispossessed warriors. The Defense of Burek Mountain In search for an ancient spirit staff which had been stolen by the Imperium centuries ago, the Eldar of Ayandan launched a sudden strike upon the Shrine Moon of Buran. Their wraith constructs soon overwhelmed the defenders, leveling buildings in their search and the 54th Scion Jackals were scrambled and charged with protecting the relic at all costs. When a Wraith ship of Ayandan burst into the atmosphere of Buran, and Wraith constructs began to walk across the Shrine World, the PDF was vastly outmaneuvered. Ayandan Wraith Guard and Wraith Knights moved with precision from temple to shrine, bringing their ferocious firepower to the people of Buran. Imperial tanks buckled and crumbled, Bridges collapsed, sending hull units and support vehicles plummeting into icy waters. Hab blocks were folded into nothingness. As for the majority of the PDF troopers, their souls were ripped away and cast into the war, or their bodies burned by waves of plasma. Led by Spirit Seer Alanik, 
The Andan Eldar scoured the moon, apparently searching for something. A distress signal was sent to the nearby planet of Maylock. A Militarum Tempestus Regiment, the 54th Cyan Jackals, had taken up a temporary garrison upon the planet after their former training planet was destroyed by High Fleet Leviathan. Maylock was a verdant world and would almost have been a paradise had it not been for the frequent attacks launched on its inhabitants by the Eldar. As a result, few Scions were more adept at anticipating the Xenos movements than the 54th Cyan Jackals. Led by Tempestal Prime Valderac, they were issued with the precise coordinates of the supposed target of the Eldar, a relic which was held within an underground shrine in the heart of the Burek Mountain. Dropping from their ships, the Scions grab shooted into position at the peak of the mountain. From there, they trekked down towards the underground compound before the Eldar even knew they had arrived. Valderac ordered his Scions to survey the surroundings, trusting the skills that his scouts, the eyes of the Jackal, had developed on Maylock. Before long, the Scions had located a number of Ayandan wraith constructs approaching the foot of the mountain. Issuing the locations on his slate monotron, Valderac ordered a sequence of explosive traps to be laid in the path he anticipated the Eldar would take. Then he promptly began to recall Scions from various parts of the mountain and position them in staggered formations around the entrance to the underground shrine compound. The Tempestal Prime then directed further squads of Scions to locations deep inside the labyrinthine chamber. Valderac's traps detonated, the bright explosions indicating the approach of the Wraith constructs. A light force of Scions remained scattered across the mountain, with the bulk of the troops now in the mountain or around the single entrance. Valderac knew only this one route into the shrine existed. Even with their advanced weaponry, if the Eldar were to claim their relic, they would have to get past him. Across the Clarion Vox Relay, Valderac learned of Eldar constructs unleashing waves of plasma at the Scions at the foot of the mountain, and squads being disintegrated by horrendous weapons. But the pivotal point of the battle came by a truly unexpected method. The Andan Wraith ship descended towards the peak of the mountain and unleashed a devastating beam of harnessed solar energy, lighting up the moon. In this alien dawn, the mountain itself began to overheat and fall apart, the corridors glowing as hot as laser beams. Defense would have to be turned into an attack. Valderek vox for aid from the navy in destroying the Wraith ship, and he ordered his scions out into the open. The 54th Scion Jackals burst out into the light. Having learned the topography of the surrounding area, Valderek ordered the 54th into a vast chevron formation to advance down the mountain, drawing the Eldar forces with them, while he alerted the other squads as to the position of the enemy. The Jackals knew from experience upon Maylock that to stand a chance of victory, they would have to focus on the weak points of the Wraith constructs. With hotshot weaponry, the Scions seared through limb joints as they drove spear-like into the ranks of unliving warriors. Sword-wielding constructs lurched through the forests to the east after feigned retreats, straight into thick formations of other Scions, as they had been forced to do many times on Maylock. No sooner had the Eldar of Iandan learned of the Scions' tactics and begun to adapt to them, banishing the souls of many unfortunate soldiers into the warp, then Valderek altered his plans once again. This time, dozens of squads parted swiftly, baiting the smaller wraith constructs so that the rest of the regiment could surround the largest. Valderek's savage claws, special weapons specialists, began to direct a combination of melting fire and gouts of plasma at a towering wraith knight, striking from all sides before moving swiftly to avoid its gravity-twisting weapons and thick plumes of plasma. Despite inflicting horrendous damage to the walker, whole squads of scions were lost to its vengeful attacks. Eventually, Valderac received the message that the regiment's Valkyries had arrived. His scions were able to hold off the Wraith Knight long enough for the Valkyries' aerial firepower to aid them in destroying the immense walker. Once it had been brought down, Valderac ordered the 54th to commence hunting the rest of Eandon's warriors. Finally, a Lunar-class cruiser's swift attack drove away the Eandon Wraith ship before the mountain could disintegrate entirely, and the sacred compound remained safe. Tempestal Prime Valderec lost 46% of the 54th in the action upon the moon of Buran. 
Disappointed with this loss, he forced the remaining Scions into more disciplined training regimens upon their return to Maylock. The Ordo Tempestus. The organization of the Imperium is so complex that many a Lexa mechanic has lost his mind attempting to comprehend it. Within the Ordo Tempestus, however, there are chains of structure that have remained unbreakable through the ages. The Ordo Tempestus is amongst the most rigidly codified of all Imperial organizations, for its men form the backbone of the Astra Militarum. Though the Ordo is technically a sub-faction governed by the Adeptus Administratum, it enjoys a far greater amount of autonomy than the regiments that often fight alongside it. The Ordo's ranks are primarily comprised of Commissars and Tempestus Scions, though they have often included specialist factions mysteriously absent from Imperial records. In every theatre of war across the galaxy, the Ordo's men fight alongside the incalculable might of the Astra Militarum, their elite training complementing the sheer manpower of the Imperial Guard. If the Ordo provides the rigid skeleton of discipline that holds the Astra Militarum together, it is the Commissars who are the minds of the operation. The Officio Prefectus governs and controls the regiments of Tempestus Scions and Imperial Guardsmen alike ensuring that their military force is put to the right use in the Emperor's name. All Commissars are trusted to improvise new orders on the battlefield, a rare privilege in the rigidly controlled structure of the Imperial War Machine. But it is only the most senior of their number, known as Lord Commissars, who are truly independent. They are warriors of great personal charisma, and they will often inspire the men by leading from the front rather than from the behind the barrel of a bolt pistol. The Tempestus Scions do not form the main body of the Astra Militarum, for that duty falls to the regular Imperial Guardsmen. Instead, they can be likened to a knife, a thrusting point of lethal force that is applied with shocking speed into the foe's weakest point. Many a grinding war of attrition or extended campaign has been brought to a dramatic close by a strike force of Tempestus Scions. More often than not, their insertion, mission completion, and extraction parameters are all accomplished on the same day. As well as being the elite wing of the Astra Militarum, the Ordo Tempestus is the training ground for the Imperium's finest operatives outside of the legendary Adeptus Astartes. It works alongside the Scholar Progenium, whose facilities are governed by the Ecclesiarchy, to provide key Imperial institutions with the best recruits the galaxy can provide. The Scholar Progenium takes a constant influx of war orphans from the embattled worlds of the Imperium of Man. These young individuals are officially known as Progenia Novum. Mindscaped, schooled and trained to an almost inhuman degree, those, almost, those who pass their trials of compliance and make it past Selection Day are then split off to serve in the different organs of Imperial Hierarchy. The majority of these cadets are assigned to the Scholar Tempestus, where they complete the grueling training necessary to become Tempestus Scions. The death rate amongst each year group of recruits is high, but the Scholar Tempestus is as merciless as it is efficient. After three years of intense physical and mental conditioning, those who survive their training are assigned to a Scions regiment and join the Militarum Tempestus in earnest. From that point on, they are issued with the very best of equipment and resources the arsenals of the Ordo Tempestus can provide. In return, they are expected to give their lives in the service of the Imperium and to obey the orders of their superiors without question, no matter the horrors that confront them. Only those progenia with the strongest minds and most unshakable resolve are given the chance to join the Officio Prefectus. Assuming they can prove themselves able to put aside such ephemeral concerns as humanity and compassion, come Selection Day, these prospective Commissars are assigned to the Scholar Prefectus. There, they spend several years learning the finer points of the Imperial Creed, the Tactical Imperium, and even sections of the Codex Astartes. Once each of their spheres of knowledge is complete, they will be given the uniform and authority of a full member of the Officio Prefectus. Entrusted with a bolt pistol, the holy instrument of authority and vengeance, presented to all of their brethren, and frequently given a power sword for close quarters fighting, the Commissar is ready to instill discipline and strike the fear of the Emperor into all those within the Ordo Tempestus and without. 
Female cadets who show both physical aptitude and a burning faith in the Emperor will be sent to the Adeptus Sororitas via one of the bodies that govern their ancient orders, the Covenant Sanctorum or the Convent Prioris. It is there that the sisters in training learn the secrets of the mechanical wonder that is power armor and how to wield the holy trinity of Balter, Flamer and Melter. Males who take the creed of the Emperor into their hearts and events an almost supernatural degree of faith will instead be requisitioned by the Adeptus Ministorum. Some of these find themselves seconded to the Astra Militarum regiments, much like their Commissar contemporaries, whilst others bolster the Adeptus Sororitas, go back into the Scholar Progenium as drill abbots, or even lead armies of the faithful in their own right. To join the Adeptus Ministorum is an honour beyond measure. From amongst their ranks, the most devout leaders of the Imperium are born. Individuals of a more scholarly bent, as well as those whose minds are suited for the grinding tedium of clerical and logistical roles, will instead spend the rest of their lives in the Adeptus Terra. Each trained adept has not only an exceptional mind, but also a solid grasp of the military arts due to his time in the Scholar Progenium. On those rare occasions that insurrection breaks out in a data slave compound, or pedanticum complex, the prospective troublemakers may find themselves choking on their own heretical pamphlets, with their brains dashed out by the bookish but unexpectedly violent overseer they had previously thought of as easy prey. The most secretive of all the organizations that recruit their agents from the Scholar Progenium is the Emperor's Holy Inquisition. Powerful beyond measure, the Inquisition takes only those who excel physically, mentally, and spiritually. Though these prodigies join the ranks as acolytes, under the province of a more senior inquisitor, the canniest and most capable of their number will become inquisitors in their own right. Theirs is the right to change the course of history, to send entire battle groups of the Astra Militarum and chapters of the Adeptus Astartes into the fires of war, and even to consign fully populated planets to oblivion, should they deem it necessary. All who graduate from the Scholar Progenium join a group of exceptional individuals who impose the Imperium's will on a hostile and uncaring galaxy. Their influence is spread across the stars, guiding the lesser orders of mankind by the will of the High Lords of Terror themselves. By the skill and discipline of those taken from their families and reforged in the fires of adversity, the realm of mankind will stand or fall. And there we have it, the history of the Tempestus Scions and Commissars. And it, they're a really interesting take. I mean, there's one thing that I want to just say. There's a, there's a neat uh, discrepancy, shall we say, in the law. Uh, for instance, in Gaunt's Ghost, I guess most prominently, um, you know, like Gaunt has, like, the whole mindscaping thing and stuff like this. I mean, I guess you can get away with it saying different parts of the galaxy do it differently, whatever, to a certain degree. Although there's a standardization with the Scholar Progenium, but it's definitely like a. Uh, an error, shall we say. <laughs> Commissar, you know, he, he knows everything about his previous life. Um, you know, like, he knows his past. He knows... He's, he's even got, like, some of his dad's stuff. Like, he's got, like, a one ring, which is, like, a, a data reader, sort of, uh, like, a security code sort of thing. Uh, there's a whole, like, the first book. Of, is it the first book? The first book is, like, pretty much built on all that. Plus his whole thing with his uncle, who he kills... All that sort of stuff, like, you know, and also there was that new one with that, um, I forgot what she's called, that female commissar, she's got, like, a fob watch of her parents and stuff like this, like, she remembers her past and stuff, so that's, like, an oversight, I think, in the law, but, you know, I excuse that for whatever reason, you know, but um, I like this version of it, that they're sort of, like, they've created a group of people, because you sometimes people say, how could the Imperium operate? Well, it's it's because of things like this, they've got a constant crop, a self-perpetuating constant crop of utter loyal people for the Imperium, you know, they've been completely indoctrinated and mind-wiped um, and just filled with the Imperial Creed. And these guys perform a constant flow of a dedicated, um, strong force of people, you know, permeating all Imperial institutions. Not just the military thing, like you were saying there, they join the Adeptus Terra and stuff like this. And people might not know that they are Scholar Progenium orphans, right? But all of them have been trained in this way that they are just like, you know, like utter utter fanatics for the imperium in every way so it's like well how does the imperium manage to maintain this because it's got people like this in it you know like it's populated by people like this 
And uh, it's interesting to me. It's very interesting to me. I like that they'll take the children from the nobility and spread them out, even for, like use them as the enforcers of the imperial creed, the imperial law, and stuff like that. It's interesting, and they permeate every faction. So it's not that they don't recruit normal people into these groups, but within these groups themselves, there are you know like within the Arbites, they might recruit local people from local places. Like planets and stuff like this do actual normal recruitment, like an Imperial Guard regiment would. Would, but uh, within that, there's there's these individuals who are, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, are they even real people at that point? They've just been mind wiped and and like indoctrinated to the fullest. You know what I mean? It's everything like a space marine would be, to be honest. Aside from, um, it's the same techniques that create a space marine, but lesser lower lower level, obviously, and it doesn't come with the. Um, the sort of cultural stuff that comes with it. Well, I guess it does because they're filled up with like Imperium, the Imperium. Anyway, it's a really interesting, interesting uh, area of the law. And commissars obviously are always fun, but it's fun to see where they come from, I think. But yeah, the, the process that goes through them. Obviously, Tempestus Scions used to be just called Stormtroopers uh, back in the day. And I think they've gone for a bit more of a sort of uh, 40k-ish kind of quasi-Latin sort of name for them. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, common, this, is, this has always been basically the law of it, but this one really sort of breaks it down and gives a lot more detail in a, in a way that some of the others didn't. It was kind of like half mentioned. Like like I say, in the Gorn's Ghost stuff, he, he covers his time in the Progenium. But it's different. And I think it might be, like, it, it's, it's quite like this, but it's not the same, you know? There isn't the mind wiping and stuff like that. So it's, it's uh, I think it's like, you can kind of excuse that kind of thing. Like, the Imperium is a big place. In general, you know, like they say, one Imperium, one vision, whatever. That sort of covers all of it, but like there's regional variants, if you get me. I think that's probably a, a better way of looking at it. But anyway, thank you all very much. I hope you have enjoyed this exploration of these guys. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I will say, I do miss the old look at the Stormtroopers. If you can find Metal Stormtroopers, the old ones, uh, they were sick. They looked amazing. Uh, they were so good. They had very much like, the, they looked a lot like, um, what's that film? Soldier. So, you ever seen Soldier? That they, they had that look about them with the... Uh, it was a lot more of a sort. I guess it was a bit more of a sort of modern look, um, like a current era sort of look about of special forces, of heavy infantry special forces, than what they've gone for now, which is a lot more. It is definitely much more of a 40k sort of. It is much more 40k with the sort of baroque nature of the armor and stuff like that. But I, I did like the no nonsense, um, heavy modern, advanced sci-fi heavy infantry. I like that look. But anyway, I'm just ranting now. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you all again next time. Let me know what you think in the comments. Cheers. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Oh, and thank you to everybody supporting the channel. You can see your names going by here. Thank you, lads. You guys you guys are the ones who uh, support the channel and uh, help this sort of stuff get made. So thank you ever so much. Eternally, thank you. If you'd like to support the channel, become a YouTube member, become a Patreon, go on subscribe star, whatever works best for you. There's links in the description to help if you want to. But please do give the video a like and subscribe and let me know in the comments. And I'm ranting again. Ta-ra. Bye-bye.